Your Excellencies, Ministers, uh, esteemed experts and scientists, ladies and gentlemen. A little over 10 years ago, representatives from over 180 countries gathered in Bali for the 13th Conference of the Parties to the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Just a few days before, the Nobel Peace Prize had been awarded in Oslo to the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Through this, IPCC received a strong recognition of the work and recommendations of thousands of scientists around the world. 2015, three years ago, gave us both the Paris Agreement on Climate and the Sustainable Development Goals. Agreement on these universal policy goals came after lengthy discussions and is now the guiding principles for our joint efforts to ensure a sustainable development. The most important feature of both agreements is the universal nature of the commitments. They apply to all nations. In short, they are everyone's roadmaps for global sustainable development. They confirm that we are in this together and we must find soli solutions together. Obviously, countries will individually implement and report their own domestic measures to fulfill these obligations. In Norway, our government has decided that all ministries should report on their own contributions and achievements in the annual budget paper presented to our national parliament. We are, all, we are already experiencing that some targets are harder to reach than others, but we see progress. 1st of January this year, Norway's Climate Act made our national climate goals into law. Based on our Paris contribution, Norway is now legally committed to become a net zero emission economy in 2050. That would require emission reduction of some 80 to 95 percent from our 1990 levels. The road there goes through a target of an at least 40 percent reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2030 and becoming emissions neutral by the same year. We aim to fulfill this through a collective delivery with the EU and its member states. Minister Siti Nurabaya, Excellencies and colleagues, in Norway's economy, we have four main emission sources. Around 50% of the emissions are already covered by the emission trading system, the ETS, of the EU, originating mainly from industry, aviation, and the oil and gas sectors. Remaining emissions mainly come from transport and agriculture. Our electricity needs are covered almost entirely by our vast renewable hydro power resources. One of the policies that have received international attention is the tax exemptions and other attractive incentives for Norwegians who buy electric cars. This has led to a massive growth in sales of electric cars and the number of new cars with the traditional fossil combust combustion engine now is surpassed, surpassed by emission-free or hybrid cars. Norway has the highest share of electric cars per capita in the world and this has happened in a few years. We are using this momentum in moving towards electric transport solutions also at sea, with the national ferry system gradually phasing out diesel engines and switching to batteries. As you are all well aware, the biggest challenge yet is our oil and gas sector, where emissions from our production continue to represent a sizable source. Here, the government is investing substantially in research and development on carbon capture storage, a technology also recognized by IPCC as key to realize Paris Agreement. As for our global contribution, I'm happy to confirm that rainforests remain Norway's biggest climate priority. And there, I would like to remind everyone how important the Bali meeting back in 2007 actually was. Ministers, Bali marked the first COP where major decisions on climate and forest were made. A broad coalition of governments, civil society, business and scientists managed to convince the conference. The time had come to formally recognize the role of tropical forest protection in any credible fight against global warming. The message was clear. Without quickly halting and then ending tropical deforestation, it would be possible to reduce emissions at a scale which would prevent the reversible rise in global temperature. As you know now, 
and will discuss here in Jojakarta, the decision led to the launch of a large number of programs and projects that could deliver emissions, emission reductions. We got the Forest Carbon Partnership Facility of the World Bank, the UN RED program, and many smaller projects. Adoption of RED Plus in the Climate Convention mobilized a new and additional funding stream in climate finance. Some of these very much being implemented in Indonesia as we speak. Ladies and gentlemen, one of these initiatives born out of Bali is the International Climate and Forest Initiative. Norway pledged up to 3 billion Norwegian kroner a year and promised to work closely with tropical forest countries to end tropical forest laws while improving the livelihoods of those who live off, in and near the forests. An agreement, the letter of intent, was signed with Indonesia in 2010. The government committed Indonesia to large emission reductions. A forest moratorium was issued to stop issuance of new logging concessions and aimed at improving governance of primary natural forests and peatlands. The moratorium covered an area of between 64 and 72 million hectares. It sent a strong political signal of change from both countries. Indonesia would lead the fight to save its rainforest. Norway would provide large-scale financial support to enhance the efforts. Since then, the moratorium has been renewed several times and even been supplemented with special measures to address peatlands. Indonesia's ecosystems are incredibly valuable and sustain the livelihoods of more than 260 million people living on more than 900 islands. Blessed with some of the richest ecosystems in the world, with more plant and animal species than most other nations in the world, this offers many opportunities for discovery, innovation and explanation that will benefit all mankind. Forests play a vital role in any development scenario facing us, but it also the most important source of emissions. Indonesia plays an important role in reducing its carbon footprint through ending deforestation and draining peatlands and in restoring degraded forest lands. In succeeding, you will have made a massive global contribution to reach the Paris goal. Your Excellency Minister Siti Nurabaya, even though it has taken more time than originally anticipated to establish the fundamental components of the partnership, with continued strong leadership from President Jokowi, yourself, and your teams, 2018 might still be the year when Norway can announce the first result-based payments to Indonesia for achievements in reducing domestic forest loss. And when that happens, it will be the crowning example of what two countries, supported by many friends, can accomplish together. It is never easy to change the dynamics of an economy. It requires us to think very differently about what carries value for us in our daily lives, such as clean air and clean water. Reform efforts will always be challenging until you find new economic activity that is less damaging to our environment. Governments must lead this transformation, but do depend on partnerships with industry, local and adult communities, civil society organizations and universities. There will always be a transaction cost because if the risks involved, because of the risks involved. Red Plus can reduce these costs and help kickstarting the economy, economic transformation across sectors. Through Red Plus, forest can actually continue to be a financial source, but now without a single tree being cut and sold for profit and no peatlands trained. In its most simple form, Red Plus aims to produce independently verified emissions reductions that will automatically and predict predictably trigger payments from donors and other partners. This, in turn, will provide Indonesia with valuable additional financial resources that can then be used to invest in improved welfare and jobs for the Indonesian people in a new low carbon climate economy. Friends, we must recognize that Indonesia has a strong agrarian economy, depending on farmers and agro-industry for jobs and growth. In most countries, agriculture is the biggest driver of deforestation. So finding better agricultural practices is important if we are to combine environmental and economic goals. Recognizing the importance of shifting from expansive to intensive production, governments must use a combination of stick and carrot 
to ensure our food production does not replace our forests and peatlands. And this shift cannot be an interim one. The change must be permanent. Ladies and gentlemen, many of you in this room has worked tirelessly for more than a decade to end the days of deforestation in Indonesia and beyond. And even though important progress has been made, and though our coalition of partnerships are growing, it is important to use events like the Asia-Pacific Rainforest Summit to recognize that the job is not yet finished. I will therefore close by wish you the best of luck in the discussions during these three days, giving us new knowledge and approaches to end deforestation and forest loss. In closing, let me thank our host, the Ministry of Environment and Forest, the Government of Australia, and C4 for making this event possible. I wish you all a successful conference. Thank you very much for your attention.